Hi, this is Ms. Delosier, and these are your notes on the cell membrane and transportation through the cell. So uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to review the structure of the cell membrane, and this is going to take forever to draw, so I'm going to skip it. All right, so the cell membrane, as we've talked about, is a phospholipid bilayer. So it's two layers of phospholipids with a fatty acid tails pointing each other. But um, that's kind of an oversimplification because the cell membrane also contains proteins, uh, and those proteins act as channels to allow things to pass through from one side of the membrane to the other side, making the membrane selectively permeable. But also, there's proteins that are peripheral proteins that are on one side or the other of the membrane that have um, receptors attached, and those receptors are typically carbohydrates, and they allow uh, outside things to signal to inside of the cell. So uh, that's the basic structure of the cell membrane, and what we're going to talk about is movement into and out of the cell. And so um, there's different ways that movement into and out of the cell can happen. It can happen passively, which doesn't require any energy, or it can happen actively and require the expenditure of ATP. It can happen through just the phospholipid bilayer, so there are certain molecules that can actually pass straight through the, the fatty acid layer, um, but it can also happen through those protein channels. Um, and then there's also uh, the possibility of moving into or out of the cell membrane through endo or exocytosis, which we'll talk about. So let's start with talking about passive transport because that's probably what you're most familiar with. So passive transport happens via the diffusion of molecules from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So um, the basic form of diffusion, the one that you've heard about the most, is probably simple diffusion, which is just molecules move through the bilayer um, from high concentration to low concentration. So like if you had a whole bunch of carbon dioxide, a high carbon dioxide concentration within a cell, the carbon dioxide can diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer to the lower concentration in the interstitial fluid. And it's not going to move all of the CO2 out, but it's going to move it so that it's at equilibrium. So it's at equal levels, equal concentrations between uh, both sides. So it works on a gradient property and it just happens. They have to be small molecules and they have to be nonpolar molecules. The next type is osmosis and osmosis is simply diffusion of water um, and it actually happens through special structures in the cell membrane but that's beyond the scope of the class so I'm not going to focus a ton on aquaporins. And so let's look at um, let's look at the cell membrane again. So here I have my phospholipid bilayer, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to label outside and inside, and I'm going to have a high level of oxygen concentration outside of the cell, right? And then a low level inside of the cell. So ideally, I would like to go ahead and have that oxygen diffuse into the cell. And so that's what happens just based on the, the principle of diffusion and that concentration gradient. What will happen is the oxygen will move in until I have an equilibrium between the sides. And so that's simple diffusion. Um, and the next type is facilitated diffusion. So facilitated diffusion is through a protein channel. Uh, so this is going to be primarily for large or charged polar molecules, uh, things like glucose, sodium ions, stuff like that. So we're going to look at an example that uses glucose molecules, but I'm not going to draw the glucose because I'm lazy, I'm just going to draw a bunch of uh, polygons that are the same shape as glucose. So let's draw my bilayer. I have outside and inside my bilayer, and I'm going to go ahead and put a protein channel in there, and then I'm going to draw my glucose. So you can see I've got a higher concentration of glucose outside the cell membrane than inside the cell membrane, and obviously glucose provides us with our ATP through cellular respiration. So we need to find ways to move that glucose in. And glucose is too large of a molecule to diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer. So it needs a channel. So we're gonna go ahead and we have my higher concentration outside, lower concentration inside. So that glucose will simply diffuse through the, the membrane, but through the channel. And that's facilitated diffusion. It uses a protein channel. That's the basic difference between the two. So those are passive transport examples. We're going to move on to another example that's a specific example of passive transport. 
and that is going to be filtration. So filtration happens in capillaries. So this is my really terribly drawn capillary, don't judge me. Uh, and filtration basically is going to depend on, um, it's going to, going to determine how things flow from inside the capillary to outside. So I've got a whole bunch of little tiny particles throughout the, the fluid outside the capillary and within the capillary. I have large molecules in the capillary, okay? And the blood flows through the capillary, of course. So filtration forces tiny molecules, small molecules, through the, the, the membranes of the capillary walls based on pressure. So you have that pressure flowing, the blood is flowing through the, uh, the capillary, and so that's gonna create an area of high pressure. And so what that's gonna do is it's gonna push those smaller molecules through the capillary membranes. And so that's filtration. Um, again, that doesn't require the expenditure of energy because the, the, um, the force is coming just from the pressure of the blood flow. So now let's move on to actual active transport. So we're gonna talk about active transport. Remember, active transport um, is gonna move molecules, uh, but it's gonna require energy. So it moves molecules from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. Um, and so it requires energy in the form of ATP. So it depends on a protein channel uh, exclusively. You can't have active transport just through the phospholipid bilayer. There has to be some type of protein channel because the ATP is basically going to turn on that channel. It's basically flipping a switch to allow the channel to, to, to let things in against the concentration gradient because, again, we're going against we're going from low to high, so against the concentration gradient. So let's look at my, my same phospholipid bilayer, and let's go ahead and draw my, my protein. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put an absurd amount of sodium ions inside the cell and just a couple outside the cell. Now, sodium ions, depending on the type of cell, you either want them inside the cell or outside the cell at different times. but frequently with sodium ions, you're gonna be moving them back and forth. So one of the ways that you can move sodium ions into the cell in this example is through active transport. Remember, I have low concentration outside the cell and high concentration inside the cell. So to move that sodium from the top to the bottom, I need to expend energy. And that's ATP use through active transport. So that's the definition. Um, of, of active transport. So we're going to look at the other ways that you can go ahead and move things into and out of the cell. Um, and these are all going to require energy expenditures, but they work a little differently than basic active transport. So they're basically going to be endocytosis or exocytosis, we'll talk about at the end. So endocytosis is going to be, it brings materials through the vesicles into the cell. So I'm going to draw you a quick picture and then I'm going to give you a physical demonstration. So I have, in the, first, in the first picture, I have my cell and I've got my green chemical on the outside. Let's say it's a, it's a food molecule. So I wanna bring that, that, that particle into the cell, but it's too large to pass through the cell membrane. So instead, the cell membrane is basically just gonna go up and engulf it and then pull it inside. And so that's endocytosis. And you end up with a small vesicle um, that contains the nutrients inside the cell, and then that would be broken down by the lysosomes and used by the cell. And so there's a couple, there's actually three different ways that this happens. The first way is pinocytosis, which is bringing liquids into the cell. Um, the second is phagocytosis, which is bringing solids into the cell. And then the last way is receptor-mediated endocytosis, which basically just means there's a receptor on the outside of the cell membrane, and when a chemical signal binds to the receptor, it triggers the cell membrane going and bringing stuff into the cell. So the uh, opposite of endocytosis is exocytosis, which is basically pushing out vesicles, and we talked about this a little bit when we talked about the Golgi. So the rough ER produces proteins, it puts them in vesicles, it sends them to uh, the Golgi apparatus, and the Golgi modifies and repackages them and then sends them out to the cell membrane. When that vesicle gets to the cell membrane, it merges, so it merges with the cell membrane 
and then basically vomits out the proteins into the interstitial fluid. So that's exocytosis. So that's it for uh, your notes on the cell membrane and on cellular transport. If you have any questions about those, please go ahead and schedule a tutorial time. Thank you.